Hello and welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment center in Seattle, Washington. The Appetite is all about issues of food, body, sport, and mental health. I'm your host, Carter Umhow, a therapist, artist, and writer. Today I have the privilege of having Lauren Donaldson and Kendra Appy here in the studio with us, both of whom are milieu therapists at Opal and heavily involved in the yoga community, both at Opal and outside of Opal. And they have been creating, along with some other therapists at Opal, a series of workshops with other yoga teachers and people in the yoga community um, called Do No Harm Yoga. The curriculum that they've developed has been featured in the Seattle Times. Lauren has actually shared her story on the Huffington Post. Um, We will make sure to link both of those resources in the show notes, so make sure that you listen to those after. But in the meantime, we get to talk to both of them. So welcome. Hi. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's so good to have you here. So um, I'd love for each of you to just introduce yourselves and let us know a little bit about who you are both at Opal and outside of Opal. Well, I'm Kendra. I am a milieu therapist at Opal, and I'm not a yoga therapist there, but I am. um, I practice yoga on my own, and I've done a yoga teacher training outside of Opal. I like to be outside. I like to cook. I like to spend time with my family and my dog. (laughs) What's your dog's name? Kriegel. Good name. Yeah. (laughs) My name is Lauren, and I am a yoga therapist at Opal, and I'm also a yoga teacher. I've been teaching for over seven years now, and before I came to Opal about a year and a half ago, I was teaching yoga full-time for many years. And then aside from yoga, I am a writer and a musician. Having been at Opal with each of you, working particularly in the milieu together, I am not at all familiar with the yoga world that both of you (laughs) have your feet in. And so I'm excited to hear more about it. Um, And my understanding is that you guys have created a really incredible sort of offering for the community in a series of lectures, workshops called Do No Harm Yoga. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Tell us about that. So the workshop started because my yoga teacher, knowing that I work at Opal with eating disorders, was asking me, how do I teach yoga to people who may have eating disorders, who may have disordered or relationship with the with food or their bodies? And it kind of made a light bulb go off for me. I did a yoga teacher training, and I didn't have any training in that. All of my training has come from working at Opal and things that I've you know done outside. I mean, I I had a little bit in grad school too, but. Um, So I thought, wow, this is a really big opportunity. Like I could share this with people and share this with my community, my yoga community, which more than us, they're kind of maybe even the front lines of like some of that, you know, seeing some people who maybe are starting out struggling with food and body or maybe are really in an eating disorder. So how can we kind of set that up so there's maybe less harm done or even more empowerment for teachers to know like what to do if someone's even if someone comes and talks to them about that. So that's how it started. But because eating disorders are so steeped in fat phobia and diet culture and all of these other systems of oppression, it's kind of like branched out. I mean, we're not just talking about eating disorders in these workshops. We're talking about other systemic factors that are at play. And if we're talking about inclusivity for people who might have food and body issues, then We need to be talking about inclusivity for all people in yoga. So that's kind of how it just all came to fruition. And we have great, it's Lauren and myself, and then two other yoga therapists at Opal, Madeline and Camille. Um, I'm curious about the name, and if either of you can answer this, Do No Harm Yoga, what does that refer to? For us, above all, in any yoga offering that we have at Opal. And I mean, I can speak for myself as a teacher out in the community. We want to do no harm and kind of like looking to yoga philosophy too. like one of the big pieces of philosophy is ahimsa, which means nonviolence. So I think maybe there's some connection there with our intention to do no harm with Mm -hmm. the yoga that we offer to our clients at Opal and our offerings in the community. So, Lauren, when you when you just spoke to sort of this main principle of yoga, it seems like an incredibly important tenant 
and one that I would assume most people think that they are abiding by, um, either by being in a yoga class or teaching a yoga class. But the the culture of yoga in America has spread its roots <laughs> in a lot of different new ways. Can you speak, either of you, to some of what you may see as some harm that's actually being done in yoga? I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is that yoga here in America has become a fitness practice kind of first and foremost. And so I don't know that actually a lot of people taking a yoga class would even know about Ahimsa or know about anything besides the movement practice of yoga. So that feels, I guess, to me a bit like a disservice to this really vast and beautiful spiritual practice. And with the fitness, like the incorporation of that fitness world and that model comes all kinds of other harmful beliefs and about bodies and um, size and health and yeah. What does that look like specifically in terms of a class that might be not actually in line with the original spirit of yoga in terms of how it's adapted here in the U.S.? A lot of classes tend to take the focus to something external. So, you know, like a teacher offering something and the attitude that it has to be done this specific way or um, this is the only way to practice yoga instead of kind of turning inward and thinking about like what's best for my body in this moment. So I think there are a lot of messages coming at us from the outside saying like this is what yoga looks like and this is what yoga bodies look like and this is what yoga teachers look like. And I think by that kind of like external influence, we lose some of the like connection with the internal, which I think yoga has the potential to really help with that like internal connection. Lauren, you have recently told a bit more of your story more publicly about your relationship to teaching yoga. Can you tell us a little bit about that in terms of maybe where some of these more intellectual ideas have some more personal roots for you? I came to yoga from injuring myself after running a marathon, which the intention behind that marathon was to lose weight. So that's kind of how I entered the yoga world, which I think is really common. Like we see, you know, other people doing yoga that have a body that we're interested in having. And, you know, my mentality was like, okay, if I do this, then that's what I'll have and my life will be great. (laughs) So I decided to become a yoga teacher and mixed in with that was like a true love for yoga. And I tried many iterations of being a teacher. And, you know, at the end of the day, I finally realized that this way of approaching yoga wasn't working for me and it was causing me a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. So I went through my own recovery process from my own eating disorder and eventually kind of came out on the other side through like, I think my relationship to food and body kind of came first where I learned how to like attune to my needs. And then I used those skills to, you know, help rebuild my relationship with yoga. So again, kind of like attuning to my body's needs in the context of yoga, instead of looking to a teacher or the culture outside of me to tell me like how I should be showing up in yoga. Kendra, what about you? Have you had any sort of personal experience in the yoga world that has brought you where you are now? I started doing yoga for similar reasons to what Lauren described. It was offered at a gym that I was going to and seemed like a new physical challenge to take on and maybe one that would have certain results, you know, physical, external results with my body. And I think I really started to focus internally and use yoga to connect with my body relatively recently. I'm probably in the last six years where that that changed for me it changed because I had a great teacher and uh, her style of teaching really helped me focus internally rather than focusing externally on what I thought I should be doing or what it should look like and also through that yoga community I really I actually found community so I wasn't just going to a class and leaving I met people that became really close friends and just made me want to keep going going back. Mm-hmm. It sounds like both of you were able to find some sort of 
space in which the internal was celebrated. Lauren, either I don't know for you if you had a teacher or if it was something that you were really learning through your recovery process. And Kendra, it sounds like you had an awesome teacher. As you two have been more in leadership role in a yoga space, I guess in different ways for both of you, how have you figured out how to teach that to people? What does that look like? I've learned a lot teaching yoga at Opal. And one of the big things I've learned is emphasizing choice in yoga. So connecting with present moment felt sensations that are happening in the body as sort of the tool to decide where do I want to go right now. And that can look differently moment to moment. So maybe right now I'm all in it and I'm doing all the movements and I'm going deeper in all my poses. And then the next minute later, I'm taking a break. And even though the class is moving on, I'm choosing to rest. And that is definitely a practice to tune into what my body is feeling and make choices based on that. What would you say, Kendra? Since I don't teach yoga, I'll say what was helpful for me as a student was, and I think it kind of goes well with what Lauren was describing with the choice that everything as an invitation, because I'm someone who's kind of performance oriented around athletics. And so for me, I wanted to be striving for the the challenging thing. And so not having a hierarchy presented to me of this is the most challenging and this is kind of if you want to take it easy, you can do this. Um, you know, that kind of language really helped me as a student focus more on, OK, what do I actually want to do? What is my body telling me? What is my emotional state telling me, my mental state telling me that, that I should do right now and making it a choice. Yeah. Do you see particular language being used that is exclusionary? Yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that might be the answer. What What are some examples? Like Kendra was speaking to saying something like, if you want to go deeper or if you're more advanced or if you're more flexible or if you're tighter, this kind of language that is placing like a judgment on someone's body and really like something that looks less advanced, quote unquote, can actually be like a more attuned choice, which to me makes it more advanced. Like the more attuned we are to our body's needs, the more advanced I think our practice actually is. Mm -hmm. And it might be more challenging if you're like me and you want to kind of always be striving to like hit those achievement marks, then it might be more challenging to listen to your body and take, you know, do something that's maybe more restorative or not the most physically challenging thing. I think the opposite can be true, too, that if your tendency is to always take it easy, maybe you choose Mm -hmm. something more, you know, if you're trying to challenge yourself that day, like that could also be attunement. It's not just taking it easy. I know that example gets used a lot, I think, but it could also be like pushing yourself for a couple minutes and seeing what that feels like. I actually went to the gym the other day to take it easy a little bit and like just stretch. And when I walked in, this like total meathead was at the door and was like, do you want to do like Fit Lab today? And I was like, no, that sounds terrifying. (laughs) And he's like, he kind of roped me into it. And I suddenly thought, I never do anything that's out of my comfort zone ever because I'm so used to taking it easy and like Mm -hmm. being attuned. And I think attunement today is doing something terrifying. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I went into this class. I've never, I've I've never been more exhausted in my life, but every single moment I was able to be attuned and go, Mm -hmm. okay, can I still choose to push myself? Can I still choose this? Does that still feel good? And I was able to say like, okay, I need this adjustment here. I need some help here. I need this. But it was really cool to sort of take the attunement that obviously I've worked hard for as well into a really different sphere. Mm -hmm. So it's it's cool to think about that being both in yoga and elsewhere, and yoga in particular being a place where I think those skills can be taught. Would you say that there are ways that we can think about how to make yoga more inclusive, kind of more generally, both in terms of race, gender, size? What does that look like? Yeah, I think speaking from like the yoga teacher perspective, This is something that we have often talked about in our talks that we do at Opal. 
explicitly stating at the beginning of class, all bodies are welcome here. Every person, every body is welcome here, I think would be a really powerful way to make the space more inclusive, just to say that outright. Part of the intention behind offering this to yoga teachers and studio owners in the community is because I think a lot of that message starts with how they're promoting their classes or their businesses. And right now, I think a lot of what we see on Instagram or on billboards or posters for yoga studios, it's a pretty non-diverse set of bodies and, and people who are being represented there. That's changing. It seems to be changing a bit, but we do a workshop on kind of social media presence. And if your intention is to create more diversity in your classes, how can you kind of put that out there from the beginning? So people aren't going to even come to the class at all to hear you say all bodies are welcome if they don't think that yoga is for them. And yoga is for everybody. It's a spiritual practice. So it's for anyone. (laughs) Are there ways that like in the actual yoga studio, you all have noticed any any ways that it continues to be like whitewashed or just in general, like absolutely narrowed down, even when it comes to like do this movement or do this or do that or let's think about this this way? Yeah, I think not offering choices is by nature exclusionary. Mm -hmm. And I also think even if a teacher is offering a lot of choices, those choices still might not be right for someone. So emphasizing that students have choice, because I think a lot of like the student teacher dynamic, there's a lot of power inherently if you're holding the seat of the teacher and saying that explicitly, kind of like with the all bodies are welcome here could be really powerful. And then if you know you are in a space to decide like, what props are in the room, like making sure that there are enough and that there are props in different sizes. And you know, as a teacher, how to utilize those props, like taking it upon yourself to figure out how you want to offer that kind of like adjustment. If you're, as a teacher, if you're demoing poses, just default sometimes to the pose with the props or the pose, you know, a different variation than maybe you would do in your own practice, but don't always be demoing like this more aspirational version of a, of a pose and demo for the people taking your class, like what some of them might want to do, show, show those options. What have you all learned um, doing these workshops? Like what, what has been some of the experience of being with these different teachers and people in the community involved in yoga? One of the things I've learned is just how much yoga teachers are desiring community. You know, we all desire community to an extent, but as a yoga teacher, especially if you're freelancing, moving around from studio to studio, often you don't have the time or space to come together with a group of yoga teachers to discuss these concerns. And that was certainly my experience as a teacher in various capacities. So I think yeah, just the desire to have people to talk to about these concerns is really important. Yeah, and having continued training seems to be important to a lot of the people coming to our workshops. Um, there seems to be a desire for real concrete things. You can do your 200-hour teacher training and then just be teaching for years and years and things change, the world changes, or maybe you want to change kind of how you're bringing yoga to to your students. And so it's not like with therapists where we have to constantly be getting continuing education, but it seems like that's really desired. Have you been surprised by any concerns or any things that have come up within the workshops? I don't know if I would say I'm surprised, but I'm struck by the genuine desire to learn and to support people that may be suffering from eating disorders. Mm-hmm. I think a lot all of the people that have come to our workshops are really, truly wanting to do the best for their students. Mm-hmm. It's really comforting to me as someone that doesn't really do yoga to know that there are so many teachers out there that are really striving to be better and making their spaces more inclusive and trying to make their spaces um, be a place that are more about attunement. Because I think even even on the outside, not necessarily participating in those communities very often, I 
feel like I am often receiving the vibe from the yoga world that it is about clean eating and long toned muscles and like you said, a really specific look. And I I feel really careful when I go to yoga. I don't necessarily assume it's going to be an experience. And therefore, I don't really try it as much as I would like to. I'm like, is this going to be a place that's just about athleticism today? Or does this get to be a place where I get to spiritually touch in with myself? Is it a place where I get to rest? Like, what is it going to be? I have no idea. Even if the class is labeled one thing or the other. Mm -hmm. So unclear. I share a lot of those concerns, too. (laughs) Even as somebody that does practice a lot in the community, I, I just share in that concern that those messages are real. And I'm also thrilled that there are teachers in our community that are trying to bring this information to people in a different way. I right now I'm already like really hoping for some tips from you all about where to go and who to learn from and maybe some resources that you all have access to that we could share with our audience. We have like a a list or of um, inclusive movement spaces that we could share. So beyond mm-hmm. yoga too. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Cool. What does that What does that look like? Uh, I think just other gyms, other movement spaces, dance classes, that kind of thing that are aligned with our mission at Opal. Essentially, like not promoting weight loss, hopefully having some diversity in maybe their staff and in their promotional materials and using language that is more around attunement and less around this like aspirational or like results results (laughs) oriented I'm excited about that for the people in the Pacific Northwest. And if people are listening and you all are aware of anything in your neighborhood or your community, make sure that you get on Instagram or something and tell us about it because I'm sure we'd all like to know. Beyond sort of how you've been able to apply these things into your own spaces, both as therapists and in the yoga community, how do you see kind of this attunement work that you are both so attuned to (laughs) um, being applicable in other spaces. The attunement work in yoga is just one place to practice Mm -hmm. it. I think if you've ever been to yoga, you may have heard a teacher say something like, you know, how you show up on your mat is how you show up in your life. And I think like to a degree that is true. And I think yoga is just a place to practice attunement. And that can be translated to any movement space or any space at all. It doesn't even have to be movement related. But I think, yeah, I think yoga is just a great place to practice that attunement and then, you know, kind of taking that attunement outside and applying it to riding your bike or going to a dance class or going to the gym. Watching TV. Yeah. (laughs) Engaging in your relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious if there's anything else that you just want to add to this conversation for our listeners. I would want listeners to remember that if they're going to a yoga class, they are the customer and the teacher is providing a service. They have total autonomy and choice in how they show up moment to moment. So if you want to leave or if you want to do a totally different movement than what is being offered or not participate in certain things like that is 100% up to you. And the teacher is just providing their offering of yoga and you can choose to accept or not accept that. I like that. Give me some autonomy back. So if people are interested in joining your workshops, how would that work? When is there another one coming up soon? We do them quarterly, so we don't have the date set for the next one, but I imagine it'll be sometime in September. And if they join the Opal mailing list, that's probably the best way to stay up to date because once it's scheduled, we'll send something out in the newsletter. Wonderful. And what can people expect from joining? We've done a lot of different topics. We've touched on some of them here. Like we've talked about marketing. We've talked about inclusive language, how to make your space more inclusive. And in the last one, we actually did an experiential portion where we taught a few minutes of a more typical yoga class and then a few minutes of a 
class that has more inclusive language, um, some of the things that we t- have talked about in the talks. So, so cool. Mm-hmm. So cool. We'll make sure to update everyone on any future offerings and make sure that there's a bit of a description in our show notes so people can find that easily. And thank you both so much for coming and talking about all the amazing work that you're both doing. Thanks, Carter. Thanks, Carter. Thank you so much for joining us. Once again, you will find notes in the description box about the upcoming events. By the time this is released, maybe we even have some dates set. So make sure you check that out. And if you want to follow along with Opal, join our mailing list or just find us at opalfoodandbody.com. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as well. Thank you so much to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering, to Aaron Davidson for the Appetites music, and to Hans Anderson for editing. 